What is going on, everybody? Just finished up a little Cowboys losing at Lambeau to Aaron Rodgers and the We Have Life Green Bay Packers. But first, can I tell you about my friends at Turtle Box? TurtleBoxAudio.com, promo code John, J-O-H-N. It is the best, let me repeat, the best Bluetooth speaker on the market. Long-lasting battery life. The sound quality is fantastic. It's loud. Put it outside for barbecues. Put it inside for turkey day festivities, maybe some Christmas day festivities, maybe for one of your, you know, eight crazy nights of Hanukkah festivities. I cannot recommend my friends at Turtle Box enough. The battery life, it lasts forever. Like I said, it's loud. You can also personalize colors. You're a Packer fan, boom, get the Packer colors. You're a Cowboy fan, boom, get the Cowboy colors. Right now, you go to turtleboxaudio.com, use the promo code John, that's J-O-H-N, $20 off, free shipping. Listen, all the holidays are right around the corner. It's hard to figure out what you're going to get for your brother, your brother-in-law, your father, your sister-in-law, whoever. Turtleboxaudio.com, promo code J-O-H-N, $20 off, free shipping. Can't recommend it enough. Let's dive into the show. Okay, so the Green Bay Packers walk off the Cowboys in, in overtime. And, I, you know, I think Burkhart and Olsen said it, it was must win for Green Bay. Their season was on the line. It ultimately wasn't must win, obviously, for Dallas. But to keep serve with the Eagles, who are undefeated, they're playing the Commanders, who aren't that great, tomorrow on Monday Night Football at home. They're a massive favorite. So if they lose, it'd be pretty shocking. Like, the Cowboys basically just became a wild card team. Now, it was looking like that anyway, but as long as they held serve and maybe the Eagles slip up sometime, more than likely the Eagles were going to run the table, and then you beat them at home, you see what happens. And that goes out the window with this loss. But we got to start with Green Bay. They have been a lifeless bunch. And previously, before last week against the Lions, the passing game was a joke. And last week, for the first time, I thought, Rodgers looks like crap. He didn't play well. In previous weeks, I, I put it much more on the offense and the wide receiving talent around him. And then last week, he kind of came down to their level. My, I theorized maybe he had lost some confidence. It's understandable. You start playing bad and losing over and over. I don't care who you are. I don't care what industry you're in. I don't care how great you are at what you do. You're going to lose some confidence. And it felt like he was a player that lost some confidence. Well, sometimes when you lose confidence, you need a spark. You need something to get you going. And they got that today in their second round pick, Christian Watson. I mean, he was fantastic. He had three touchdowns, but like just from an eye test, if you didn't know, you know, first year guy, fifth year guy, high draft pick, undrafted free agent, and you were just watching that game, you go, that guy's a big time talent. His speed, his playmaking, uh, it, it was something that obviously that's the reason they drafted him to stretch the field, to be an explosive player. But it's hard. It's a tough transition for from the overwhelming majority of players that get drafted in the NFL that are coming from Alabama, Ohio State, USC, Texas A&M, wherever, let alone smaller school guys. And then when you factor it in the pressure on this kid, basically taking the shoes of Devontae Adams. Now, I know he ultimately wasn't just taking the shoes of Devontae Adams. That was going to be shared with several players, including another guy they drafted, uh, the kid from Nevada, Dobbs but he's obviously banged up. But this guy has a lot of talent, and it was on full display today, and he gave him a spark. And it wasn't just the touchdowns. It was just his explosive speed popped, and Dallas couldn't do anything about it. You know, and to me, the difference in the game was him because without him, the Packers have been what they've been for the last month, uh, just an anemic passing team with no explosion and really a team that you knew if they were going to be successful on offense, what was going to have to happen? They were going to have to run for like 200 plus yards. And now it feels like Aaron Jones is, you know, one of the better running backs in the league. But if he can get help in the passing game, they have a much more well-balanced offense and a team that can compete with anybody. Dallas is pretty damn good. And the Cowboys, because of this young rookie, and obviously once Aaron started believing in him, he kept going to him and on, on the fourth and seven play that, you know, the big touchdown to basically tie the game. Like, like that's not happening in previous weeks. So to me, part of Aaron getting his swag back and his confidence back was because of this guy. And, and sometimes that's just the way football works. You need a young player, whether you've drafted him high, whether he's a fifth-round pick, when you are struggling to do something. 
And sometimes you, when you're playing a really good team, you need to do, them to do something spectacular. And he, he was awesome today. And obviously Aaron was pretty damn good when it mattered the most. And the moment that he was screaming at LaFleur, just, it just felt like he was really, really into the game. Where it felt like last week, he was not. I don't want to say he tapped out last week, but the body language was horrendous. And this week, like, that's the Aaron Rodgers and the Green Bay Packers that we've seen for the last several years. Now, they are still behind the eight ball, obviously with Minnesota winning, and we'll get into that here in a minute. Like, they got a long way to go. They're not going to win the division, but the NFC sucks. You can start rattling off some wins. They got the Titans, then they got the Eagles, then they got the Bears. Like, they're going to have to go on a run. But if they can get a young player like Watson to be productive in their passing game, stretch the field, give them some balance with with Lazard and obviously their running backs, you know, they, I don't want to say that they're going to make a run, but they at least have a chance. Why? Because they got Aaron fucking Rodgers. And on the flip side, like, I think the Cowboys are pretty good. <laughs> you know, sometimes you lose heartbreaking games on the road. Now, the Cowboys aren't always the most buttoned up operation, but when you watch them, you go, they have explosive players, you know, in the passing game. Lamb's really good. Dax, you know, not my cup of tea, but he's a solid player. And their running backs are fantastic. I mean, Tony Pollard is really good. Davis today was like, Jesus. And obviously defensively, like, they had one guy kicking their ass. But for the most part, I have a lot of faith faith in this defense. But they're a wild card team. And ultimately, unlike last year when they hosted a playoff game, like, they're going to play a playoff game on the road. And that's just difficult to do. It's hard to win playoff games on the road because this is a team to me, I would guess 11 and six at worst, probably 12 and five if I was a betting man. So it's back to back years of 12 and five. The difference is this year, fucking Eagles are, you know, going to go 15 and two, 16 and one, and you're playing a road playoff game. But luckily, here's what I will say. They do have the formula to compete. When I say compete, like to win a road playoff game. They have a good defense, notwithstanding a couple of the plays today. And when you can run the ball, you can slow down the game. Most of these teams that you're going to play in the playoffs, like it ain't going to be Aaron Rodgers. More than likely, it's going to be like, you'll be the six and you'll play Kirk Cousins in the first round. I take my chances against, if I'm the Dallas Cowboys against Kirk Cousins, the two six matchup, run the ball down their throat, play defense, see what happens. Maybe they end up at the five. So maybe they end up playing Tampa. Like the Dallas Cowboys are going to have a chance. Uh, to win a playoff game. Because to me, unlike last year where it felt they were a little pass happy, they are much more consistent in the run, obviously with the explosion, or the explosion is the wrong word, but the emergence. Like no one can even argue it, even Jerry Jones. Tony Pollard's their best running back. And they're just running games really good. And if you can play defense like that, and, and you're a physical team, you have a chance to win in January. And last year, ultimately what did them, their undoing was the penalties. So if they can cut down on those, like, I, I'm not selling all my Cowboy stock just because they lost a tough game at Lambeau to Aaron Rodgers. The game of the day was Buffalo and Minnesota. I would say it's one of the craziest last 10 minutes and then overtimes I've ever seen in my entire life. I'm not trying to be hyperbolic or, you know, be prisoner of the moment. If you watch that game, and I was just sitting on my couch when Josh Allen threw that pick on fourth and two, and th- what happened from then on out was insanity. And I, I want to start with Buffalo because props to Minnesota. They're rolling. That was a really impressive win. Justin Jefferson's like Randy Moss meets Jerry Rice. Dalvin Cook's a stud. Her cousins at, at, at these early kickoffs, y- you never want to screw with him, even though early in the game he was struggling. But let's start with Minnesota. I root for Josh Allen. He, he's a California kid from the Valley. I, I went to Fresno State. We didn't recruit him, but I got family that live in the Valley. My dad was a farmer of that area. I gravitate toward those people. I'm rooting for him to have a lot of success. He doesn't need me to root for him. He's a fantastic player. Sean McDermott's one of the, you know, four or five coaches in the NFL that I can send a text to and get one right back. I root for Sean McDermott. But what I can't argue about both these two guys as a combination is they get a little tight. And, you know, Sean is not a loosey-goosey guy. And there's nothing wrong with that. That's not his personality. Belichick is not a loosey-goosey guy. But it does feel like... One thing when you watch Bill or hell, I was watching Brian Dayball today. There's just a, an ease with Brian Dayball on the sideline. Sean is just a tightly wound guy. You know, he's one of those guys getting up at 345 in the morning. He, you know, he, his diet is perfect. It's just, he's very, very disciplined. But he's also wound pretty tight. And you feel it with his teams. Like, we've been trying to figure out what, what's up with the Buffalo Bills. 
when they're on and kicking your ass, they are the best team in the league. But when the game gets close, they kind of crumble. And I do wonder if there's just a tightness with their head coach. And I thought he fucked up the game today because the game would have been over. They were driving with about 10 minutes to go. They're up 10 points. But Minnesota had not been very good on offense. It was an 80-yard touchdown that that gave them an extra seven points. I mean, their offense was, to me, pretty anemic. Dalvin Cook busted a big run, so they got to 17 points. But it wasn't just like 17 points where you're like, yeah, they're going to end up scoring like 28. If I was a betting man at that point in time in the game, I'd have been like, at most, they score 20 points. So if you kick a field goal instead of going for it, you go up, it's 27 to 17, you go up 30 to 17, 13 points. And there's about 10 minutes left to go in the game, so you're basically talking three possessions max. Minnesota would have been in major trouble. He decides to go for it. John Harbaugh style, kill shot. Josh Allen, I'm putting this one on him, throws a pick. Then all hell breaks loose. Then they score, then they get the ball back again. They don't score, but then Josh Allen fumbles. But ultimately, like, Sean McDermott made a devastating, uh, just a disastrous decision that unraveled the team. Now, you could argue they still had chances to win. They did. But to me, the game turned and the momentum in the game changed at that decision. And then Josh Allen. What you cannot do late in games, especially when another team has taken momentum, is turn the ball over. I don't have a problem with turnovers in the first quarter, in the second quarter, even in the third quarter. But in a tight game, when you have the lead and the other team is storming back, you cannot throw interceptions. And you can't throw an interception in that spot on fourth and two. He basically gave him the game, gave him the momentum, and then boom, they start you know coming back. Then he fumbles in his own end zone. Like, that, that's one of the worst plays I've ever seen. Now, he could blame the center. I, I haven't seen the quotes. That that cannot happen. The most basic part of offensive football, the, the starting point for offensive football, is the center quarterback exchange. You practice it in peewee football all the way up to the NFL every day to start practice. It, it, it's, it's the way the sport starts. The center snapping the ball to the quarterback. And when you have a $45 million quarterback, that, that is just, it's not acceptable. And that fumble touchdown, you know, obviously gave them, a, uh, it, it gave the Vikings the lead at the time, and he led them on a field goal drive that sent them to overtime. But those two turnovers, I mean, are the only reason you're in fucking overtime. And then the pick at the end of the game, so he basically has two red zone turnovers, the pick at the end of the game that ended the game, the pick with 10 minutes left, and then a red zone turnover in his own red zone that led them to score a touchdown. It was, it's Jimmy G level stuff. Like that, that just, that cannot happen for a guy that is that talented. And those two guys, like if you want to win the Super Bowl, and I was thinking this, the biggest difference between McDermott and Josh and Andy and Mahomes, there's a looseness to Andy and Mahomes. They don't feel tight in these big spots. They actually feel free. And when you watch McDermott and when you watch Josh and the game gets to nut cutting time and the score is close and it could swing either way, you don't have that much faith that it's going to go well for the Bills. And it's the complete opposite with the Chiefs. Just last week, right, against the Titans, playing like shit all game, 17-9. You're like, oh, they're going to pull something out. And when you watch the Bills, like, they're going to blow this. <laughs> you just keep, they're really going to blow this. You don't say that when it comes to the Chiefs. That doesn't mean it's never happened. It did last year in the AFC Championship game. But to me, the biggest difference is the Bills get tight. And it starts with their head coach, and it starts with their unraveling of their quarterback. You can't turn the ball over like that. And then when you're the head coach, you just see it. Even if you didn't know McDermott, when you're watching, you just you feel is like, it's like, Sean, you got to take a deep breath, man. The team is feeding off you. And then you feed to your quarterback. And then it all just kind of falls apart. So... That's that's a very, very, very shitty loss if you're the Buffalo Bills. And on the flip side, I didn't think Cousins was playing well. I was taking notes in the first half of the uh, of the morning games, and one of my takes was going to be, you know, I just don't trust Kirk Cousins outside in cold weather games. Like him indoors. Hell, he even won a playoff game once in a dome. But when it gets cold, when it gets windy, he makes me nervous. I thought he was playing pretty shitty for the majority of the game until Josh Allen threw that pick. And then he flipped a switch. And I thought he was fantastic. He was calm, collected. He kept feeding his horse. I mean, one thing you can't dispute for Minnesota, when he is playing under control and well, they have serious firepower. 
I mean, Justin Jefferson is one of the best wide receivers, just pure talents we've ever seen. Dalvin Cook is a stud. Thielen is old reliable. Number 17 just makes plays. Like, they got legit firepower. It just starts and ends with Cousins. When Cousins unravels, they have no shot. Because even if Josh Allen is unraveling, he can still make these remarkable plays with his legs or throw a deep bomb. Like, there are limitations to Cousins' physical attributes. And today, I thought the last 10 minutes of the game and then overtime, it, it's just one of the better Kirk Cousins performances I, I remember. Given it's on the road, hostile environment, it's cold, it's windy, you're playing a good defense, you're losing. And, uh, like, I know the last week it went viral with him in the chain. I thought today was, that was fantastic. It, it really was. And, listen, a lot of people are like, Middlecoff, you're going to give them their props. I didn't see this coming. And today, I mean, that's one of the better Minnesota Viking wins, I don't know, the last, like, four or five years. <laughs> I mean, of their good teams in the regular season. That that, that was a fantastic win because part of it is you're taking the ball away from them. Now, and listen, like there's some luck involved when Josh Allen fumbles the fucking ball in his own end zone, but you take advantage of it, you fall on the ball. And then uh, Justin Jefferson, the catch he made one-handed, that was sweet. I mean, Justin, it, it's, how much fun is that guy as a player? Same, same with Dix. I mean, those two guys, they, they mentioned on the broadcast, like the two-star wide receivers, ironically, who got traded for each other, um, are just elite players. And speaking of uh, not elite, Jeff Saturday beat Josh McDaniels. Jeff Saturday was the butt of every single human being's jokes, including mine, thinking it was pretty crazy. The guy was on the couch. It turns out that Jeff Saturday was in a fantasy football league with a ton of former players. He had to give up his fantasy football team. Why? He's now the head coach of a real team. Eric Decker the former wide receiver is now running Saturday's fantasy football team. This is a guy who was that, I don't play fantasy football, but a lot of you listening play fantasy football, you know, was playing fantasy football last week and just tweeting about the NFL. And now he's coaching in the NFL. And he had, here's the thing. Like you can say what you want. It was a crazy hire. Cause it, cause it was, I mean, it, it is, but Frank Reich did not have the juice the stones, or the clout in that organization anymore to tell Jim Irsay who was going to start. Jim Irsay was telling him, Matt Ryan's bench, uh, Sam Ellinger is the starter. And you know what? In fairness to Jim Irsay, for all his craziness, I don't blame him for not listening to Frank. I would have tuned his ass out weeks ago as well. But Jeff Saturday came in and immediately says, we're going back with Matt Ryan. Irsay's cool. Do what you want, Jeff. And that was a big difference because they... Like, they have no chance to beat anyone with Sam Ellinger. He is not a starting quarterback in the NFL. And listen, Matt Ryan's got his flaws and is a diminishing player, but you get him on the right game. You can still win with him. And they went into Vegas, and they took down Josh McDaniels, who is one of the biggest dumpster fires in the history of the league. I think I saw a stat. He's, he's lost like 24 of his last 30 games. He's 2-7. and seven. This team went to the playoffs last year. This was the fifth seed in the in the AFC Last season. And now Josh McDaniels is two and seven after they trade for Devontae Adams. So you just, you can't make this up. Jeff Saturday, everyone's making fun of him. Beats Josh fucking McDaniels and the, and the Vegas Raiders in his debut game. Speaking of, of people that just make you go, is this guy better than the other guy? Colt McCoy, Kyler Murray and Matt Stafford were both injured. Stafford's got the concussion. Kyler Murray's got the hamstring. Neither of them can play. So it was Wofford versus Colt McCoy. I'm watching the Cardinals, and I just have this thought. Colt McCoy is not a more physically gifted player than Kyler. And when Kyler is on, he is, you know, a borderline top 10 quarterback in the NFL. But right now, given this year, and Kyler has not been good for the majority of it, Colt McCoy is a better player than Kyler Murray. And Colt McCoy gave the Arizona Cardinals more juice, and they beat the, the L.A. Rams, who are in complete shambles, are now 3-6, and six. And the Lions are looking at a fantastic first round pick coming their way from them. But like, I'm not, you can't bench Kyler Murray when he's healthy. You got, he's got to play because you gave him that enormous contract. But it, I, I, you can't even argue that the Arizona Cardinals in one game with Colt McCoy have been better than they have been with Kyler Murray for the last month. It, honestly, it was, it was pretty eye opening. They were just dramatically, it felt like more efficient. They had more life, they had more juice. Kyler's body language is atrocious. 
So when you're not going well, he's kind of, you know, some people are multipliers and they rise, they, they kind of rise the group. Everyone, they lift people up and other people are like the Titanic. They, they, they're energy vampires. They, they sink it. And that's what Kyler is when things are not going well. And you saw Colt McCoy, just a positive guy who believes he can win because last year he did when he filled in for Kyler Murray. And, and the Cardinals got a spark and they got a big win and basically ended the L.A. Rams season. Think about that. And like I said, I cannot do Sean McVay talk to TV. Like, bro, you, you're having a tough season. Tough shit. Like, it happens to every coach. Dude, I mean, if, if we're going to start going to coach, if you're going to go to TV, just quit now because I, I can't do that chatter for the next two months. Um, what else did I want to hit on? Justin Fields lost. The, the, the Chicago Bears lost to the uh, to the Detroit Lions, who were sneaky, you know, two-game winning streak. One thing that's cool about sports are when young, talented players start to kind of show it. And I'm not acting like Justin Fields is Patrick Mahomes or Lamar Jackson or Josh Allen. Like, he's got a long way to go. But you don't have to be Bill Walsh, you know, or Al Davis to go, Jesus, this guy's got a lot of talent. This guy possesses the ability to be a really good NFL quarterback. And over the last month, so basically his four games, he has five rush touchdowns on the ground and eight passing touchdowns. He's combined for 13 touchdowns. Like, he's a point scorer. So, you know, we can, we can nitpick, well, he, he's not great at reading this defense. He's not great at going through his progressions. Like, yeah, that part of coaching, part of getting a guy to feel more comfortable as a pocket passer, he's 23 years old. But here's what I know. On any given play, he could throw a 70-yard strike down the field. On any given play, he can bust a run for 50 yards. His athleticism and just arm power is just eye-popping. Now, do I think he's going to be some multiple-time pro bowler? I have no clue. Nobody knows. But if you're a Bears fan, if you're the Bears coaching staff, if you're a Bears front office, you have to be pretty excited that you have this just fantastic talent, that you have the opportunity to mold. And every single week for the last month, after a rough start to the season and everyone was shitting on him, rightfully so, he was playing pretty poorly, He's improved. He's improved, and he just continues to improve. Poise. Now, today, he threw a terrible pick. I mean, an awful pick. It's going to happen. He's a young player. But all the positives that I saw from him, like, I, I, I can't help. I'm obviously a bias. I'm a fan. I loved him coming out of Ohio State. But I would be pretty bullish. And as just an NFL fan, it's fun to see a young quarterback, you know, kind of improve. You know, we're not seeing that with Zach Wilson. We're not seeing that with Mac Jones. Some of these guys are going the other way. Trey Lance is, you know, has a broken ankle. And, and Trevor Lawrence is kind of hit or miss. And this guy, you know, who was the fourth pick of the quarterback group in the in the class is 13 touchdowns, last four games. His his legs, I mean, he's not as elusive as Lamar, but his top end speed is, you know, right there. I mean, he's got to be one of just pure speed, one of the fastest quarterbacks we've ever seen. His instincts and natural ability, like, you can't teach what he has as a runner. And from an arm strength standpoint, it's elite. The touch, yeah, it's just something that you just have to get better at. Josh Allen's still working on that. He's in year five. You know, I mean, it's a, it's a constant work in progress. But I, I'm very, very bullish with what I see out of Justin Fields.